coming to you from Forager Brewery in Rochester, our town. Welcome to Our Town, the show about Rochester. I'm Jen Kosky. So science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, the components of STEAM. They'll be on full display Tuesday, November 15th at the STEAM Summit. Ky Kaylee, excuse me, McGregor, Workforce Development and Education Coordinator for the Rochester Area Chamber of Commerce, has been working hard to make this event a success. Kaylee, welcome to Our Town. We're happy to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, STEAM. So, I had always heard STEM, right? Yes. Science, technology, engineering, and math. Correct. So, where, where did the A come in? What is, what is this about? They actually started from a movement pioneered by the Rhode Island School of Design. They ah. added arts and design to the equation of the traditional STEAM, STEAM fields based on the idea that innovation through art and design is really poised to transform our economy in the 21st century, just as science and technology did in the last. So, the STEM fields have been a focus for some time now, and they're saying we need to get creative, yeah. and innovation comes from creativity. So that's why we really felt it was important to incorporate that in and we're championing this movement that they started. <laughs> so is this, you're seeing this nationwide? Yes, yes, it is a nationwide movement. I think some are slower to get on board than others, but I think we'll only see it grow in the coming years. Because Rochester is so progressive, right? Oh yes, yes. <laughs> so they're combining, you're combining arts in collaboration with engineering and math and sciences. Correct. All right, so this is really encouraging for someone like me who has an English and a writing degree and has wondered how I fit into the STEM model. Absolutely. I think so many students have been kind of left out of the picture in the past. Yes, the STEM fields are incredibly important and they've been in demand more and more over the years, but people have been shying away from those creative components and we're looking to tell those students that that's just as important and we need that for moving forward and changing our society and innovating just as much as those other fields. So. So let's talk a little bit about, though, these de in-demand science fields. What are you seeing in the workforce looking forward, um, which is the reason we're trying to get our students to learn more about them? Absolutely. STEM fields have been really in demand for the past decade, two decades, if not more. It's something that grows more and more every single year. Projections only continue to escalate. And it's not just in the most traditional STEM fields, like being an engineer or a computer scientist. There are so many other areas and jobs and career paths that these fields or skills within these fields do apply to. So they're things that are applicable to pretty much any job you go into nowadays. Technology is important in every aspect of our lives today, so it's something that can be applicable no matter what a student is looking to do in the future. So and what are some of the hot jobs, though? What are you looking at as some of the big ones that are coming up? Particularly in the Rochester area and southeast Minnesota, the region manufacturing, there's so much technical skill required in manufacturing that people don't know about. Um, of course, the healthcare uh, industry is huge here. That's incredibly important. Um, and computer information, um, IT, computer science, things like that with IBM here and a lot of startup companies, that's something that's really big and important to those jobs as well. Okay, so let's talk about the summit while we yes. still have you here. Tell me all about it. Where is it being held? Who is going to be there? So the summit is November 15th, this coming, not this coming, but the Tuesday after next. Okay. Um, it's at the UCR Regional Sports Center at okay. RCTC. So in attendance, we will have over 2,000 very eager middle and high school <laughs> students. So uh, one minute, are they being bused in from schools to yes. do this? Okay, so yes. they're all being involved. Yes, okay. and most of the teachers that bring students are teachers that bring their students every single year. So while it's new students, it's the same teachers and chaperones because they really have found the re summit to be a good resource for their students. So they okay. continue to bring them back each year. And so who, what will they see at the summit? So we have over 50 to 60 different exhibitors wow. from our, all of our area of business from all walks of life. So we will have those manufacturers, engineers, construction workers, we'll have people from Mayo Clinic, we'll have RCTC's healthcare and education and horticulture programs, we'll even have DMC represented, they'll have some of the placemakers that were at the prototyping festival ah, yes. showing how to design a city because that's part of our InDesign as well. So it'll really be a wide array of different individuals and companies represented. So they will have booths there and the students can come in and ask questions and interact and different displays? Yes, and today we're, uh, this time we're encouraging students to engage even more with exhibitors by asking them 
fun facts about their organization or skills that will be needed to do that. And they'll actually create a STEM card and record some of those things that they ask the exhibitors and be able to enter those completed cards and for the chance to win some raffle prizes. Okay. So we're hoping to really engage them. So it sounds like a lot of fun. It is, yes. And is this your first one? It is my first one. I have seen and heard so much about it, but um, it's a really popular event and it's actually the Chamber's biggest event. So I'm really looking forward to it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming in and talking to thank us. Thank you so much. is brought to you in part by the following amazing people and organizations. Clement Subaru, proudly partners with award-winning KSMQ Public Television. Clement Subaru of Rochester. Clement's clear value promise is to make buying a car fast, fair, and simple. The University of Minnesota Rochester, an undergraduate health sciences university offering education designed to change tomorrow's health care. University of Minnesota Rochester, always in the heart of our community. Prow Company, a hands-on commercial property leasing company. Leasing commercial properties in Rochester, Minnesota since 1952. Realtors and brokers welcome. Prow Company. The Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, and the citizens of Minnesota. And the members of KSMQ Public Television. Thank you. Apples, appellate courts, and appreciation. Stick around, more great stories coming up on Our Town. We meet Fred and learn about apples at Seacalf Orchard. The Minnesota Appellate Court was in town this week, and we find out why. And we get a little appreciation for what it's like to walk in the shoes of another. His job for a day is up next on Our Town. Hi, my name is Pam Whitfield and I'm one of the co-organizers along with Regina Mustafa and Don Sanborn of this event, Hijab for a Day, which is sponsored by the Rochester Downtown Alliance. This event is the culmination of four months of work by about a dozen people. We wanted to have women experience what it was like to cover for a day, both Muslim women who don't cover and non-Muslim women who don't cover, such as myself, and to uh, look at women's perspectives and women's experiences. We are at the Rochester Civic Theater, which also supported the event by giving us the venue. We are seeing a multimedia event that has documentaries of each woman's experience followed by her personal story, either told as a poem, an essay, or some sort of public speaking. There's going to be live music, there's going to be spoken word, and then at the end there'll be a community dialogue. So it's, and there's also a photography exhibit in the lobby. We joke a lot about how our trio of women, we have a dreamer, a detail person, and a networker. I think they mean I'm the networker. And um, it was much more difficult than we anticipated. I mean, really, the money was spent very early on. We, we were um, working for free, and we put in way more hours than we thought, especially Regina and Dawn, because they edited the videos. They did really the hardest work, in my opinion. I got the performers, and I did a lot of the PR and marketing and networking. But um, I wrote the grant to the Rochester Downtown Alliance to get funding to support this project because I personally wanted to cover. I had met Regina Mustafa and been to her Faith Talk show, and I knew that she had done a really small version of this project with two of our friends last winter for her talk show. And I was very interested as a women and gender studies teacher, as someone who talks to students a lot about identity and difference, about what could happen if I, if I experimented with it. This is a social experiment, and I thought this is going to be a risk-taking thing. It'll get me out of my comfort zone. It'll force me to test some of my assumptions and rethink some of my beliefs, and it'll probably help me grow as a person. And that's what all the women who participated found. And what we found early on is that this is so much more than just a headscarf or about whether or not somebody puts a piece of cloth over their head. Women wanted to talk to us about all kinds of issues, bullying, racism, their religious faith, eating disorders, women's body image, the over-sexualization of women in American culture. All these wonderful and crazy topics just came flying out of the hat because we were covering women and talking about what it was like to make the choice to cover your head so you'd have an outward manifestation of, of your religious faith. And what was so interesting to me is that um, when covering is a choice, it can be very empowering. And that was surprising to me, that choosing to cover is actually empowering. 
I know we've learned a lot from it, and I just hope that people will be more empathetic, less likely to make assumptions about others. Um, I'm a very judgmental person, so I keep reminding myself, don't be so quick to judge, and really be willing just to ask people. Every Muslim woman I've spoken to has been so open about her faith and her garment choices and what her lifestyle is like. And it's when you ask someone respectfully about themselves and you're really openly, honestly curious, people love to talk about themselves. And it's so interesting to learn from other people. And the, probably the most important thing we've learned, the participants, is that our similarities trump our differences. We are so much more alike than different. And the friendships the women in this project have forged have been a really positive side effect. So I'm hoping that the, that the audience will uh, glean some of that positive energy that we're putting off tonight and the audience will walk away thinking they want to talk more about these issues and they might want to even get involved because Islamophobia is a growing issue in this country and we need to think about all of our community members and our fellow citizens as, as mattering. We need equity. We need to care about people and be inclusive in this community. The part of the wishing... Our town. It's all about you, Rochester. Send us your best ideas for the show. Rochester at ksmq.org. Every little thing inside a closet. And she knows it's getting late. Knows it I've been waiting and I'm stuck. Hi there. That hijab for a day project is a great one. Now it's crisp, it's dark, my Halloween candy is gone, so it must be November. Just a friendly reminder to the 2,000 or so Rochester parking permit holders. In October, the city switched over to license plate registration instead of stickers or tags for your plates. So if you have a residential, business, or daytime care pri provider permit, the meter maid will now be scanning your license plate to verify your status and issue any tickets if necessary. Hopefully not too many. If you haven't done so yet, so go online, call, or go in person down at City Hall to get your vehicle registered today. Complete instructions are at rochestermn.gov. DMC is seeking community input regarding the next steps for the St. Mary's Place Subdistrict. This is the area near St. Mary's along the 2nd Street Corridor. DMC would like feedback on three concepts for the area. Connect, protect, and activate. A complete list of priorities is spelled out at dmc.mn and opportunities for submitting your thoughts are available right there as well. Now, are you looking for something to do in the face of impending indoor weather? The Origami Club, Origami, what a fun word, right? We'll be meeting on Sunday, November 6th at 3 p.m. in the Rochester Public Library. Anyone interested in this traditional Japanese art of paper folding is invited. You can give it a try, and you too can create something like this, perhaps. They meet every Sunday, they meet the first Sunday, excuse me, of every month. Now, if you are more auditory than tactile, you might want to check out the Festival of Music Concert series offered by First Presbyterian Church. The November 13th concert will feature the Twin Cities Bronze. It's a handbell ensemble. Their innovative and energetic performance style is sure to please. For more information on that, visit fpcrochester.org. Now, if you just haven't had your fill of election discussions after November 8th, I can't imagine, the Rochester Area Chamber of Commerce is happy to indulge you in one more round on Monday, November 14th. The next Community Matters After Hours is titled Election Reflection 2016. This interactive discussion will cover what happened locally, statewide, and nationally. You can register at rochestermnchamber.com. Now stay with us as we join Fred Kapoff at CCAP Orchard for this week's Our Town Walkabout. Well, I'm Fred Kapoff, and I'm the owner-operator here at CCAP Orchard with my family. The orchard was established in 1962 by my mother, and I'm the second generation. And we're standing in our beautiful mum patch uh, that leads out into our pumpkin patch. We lost about 70% of our apple crop this year. If you look at these keepsake, this is all frost damage on these apples from the, the one cold night we had in uh, the middle of May. What's your favorite apple? The one you pick right off the tree. So let's come over here and pick some regent. We have some nice regents. If we can make our way through here. It's kind of a jungle out here. 
But the Regent was always my favorite apple before the Honeycrisp came along 20 some years ago. It's a sweet apple, has a nice crunch. And as you see when I'm picking apples, you don't pull on the apple because it won't come off the tree. But if you tip it up, it just pops free nice and easily. And that's what it's about, coming out and picking apples at Seacap Orchard. The customers love it, the kids love it. Not only does an apple a day keep the doctor away, it also puts a smile on your face. I see you hear the wagon coming in. Let's go for a wagon ride. How are you doing today? That's good. I already picked my bag full. Are they yummy? Mm-hmm. Everybody that comes out here is just smiles. The parents are smiles, the kids are smiles. They're happy to be out here running around playing, going through the maze, picking apples. You know, it's, it's people are out here because they enjoy being out here. And, that, and that's really what it's about. Hey there, more in store from our town. Coming up next, Judge John Rodenberg is here and he answers our big question about Minnesota's appellate court system. Stay tuned. Our past, remembering what made us who we are today. Brought to you by the History Center of Olmsted County. Henry Caleb, born in Germany in 1832, came to Rochester in 1856, working in various fields before being elected marshal in 1877, a position he held for 22 years. In the early morning of June 15, 1879, the peace Caleb maintained was broken. Suspected robber, Dan Ganey, holed up in Rochester's Norton House. Upon finding him, Caleb quietly escorted Ganey down the street. Before long, Ganey pulled a gun and fired at Caleb, grazing his cheek. After a brief exchange of fire, Ganey reached Mueller's grocery, where one of Caleb's bullets struck him in the chest, bringing a deadly end to the chase. Burglary tools were found on him, along with a gold watch from Owatonna and jewelry from Governor C.K. Davis's residence. In appreciation for his service, Caleb received a gold pocket watch from the city and a gold-mounted ebony cane from the governor. Caleb continued to serve Rochester in many capacities and remained a highly regarded citizen until his death in 1912. The Minnesota Court of Appeals has only been around since 1983. I know for you millennials that's probably the same thing as forever, but it's not. To help us learn more about this new court, Judge John Rodenberg is here. So welcome, thank you so much for coming you, in Jen. and talking to us today. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here in Rochester. So here's our big question. If the Court of Appeals did not start until 1983, what happened before 1983? Could you appeal a case? You could. Uh, before 1983, uh, the Minnesota Constitution provided that the legislature could establish the Supreme Court and the District Courts. So any appeal had to be taken from the District Court to the Minnesota Supreme Court. Due to increasing caseloads, increasing complexity in areas of the law, that appeal right was determined and widely thought not to be um, sufficient. They had too many cases, they couldn't give them the time, that the Supreme Court that is, couldn't give the cases the attention and time they deserved and needed. So in 1982 there was an amendment proposed to the Minnesota Constitution to allow for um, the creation of the Court of Appeals. It passed overwhelmingly, I think it was about 71 or 72 percent. There was so much unanimity on that that the two uh, gubernatorial candidates in uh, 1982, Wheelock Whitney and Rudy Perpich made an ad together telling everyone to vote uh, for the constitutional amendment and it passed. And then the legislature created our court in 1983. For all direct appeals except first degree murder, uh, tax court appeals and workers compensation appeals. I'll go to this now middle level, go to the appeals court. Everything except those go to, okay. the, to our court, to the court of appeals. We also hear appeals as it happens from uh, county board zoning determinations, uh, conditional use permit determinations, licensing um, issues. I know I've sat on cases involving nurse licensing, um, dental licensing. 
So we have a variety of cases. We also hear workers, or excuse me, um, unemployment compensation appeals. And when I first arrived at the Court of Appeals in early 2012, there were a lot of those because the economic conditions at the time. The numbers of those unemployment comp appeals have gone way down. Uh, but that was a significant part of our workload for the first couple of years that I was there. So this would be if someone was denied unemployment benefits, then they would appeal that? Correct. Or if an employer uh, wanted to appeal a determination that the employee was eligible, because that, of course, has a financial impact on the employer whose unemployment compensation rates increase as a consequence of an employee making a claim. So we heard appeals from both employers and employees. So it sounds like a, a large variety, a we, big range of cases you're seeing. We do get a variety of <laughs> cases. We do indeed. And so who is we? How many of the appeals court judges are there in Minnesota? There are 19 judges on our court. Uh, eight of our number are designated from each of, as one being from each of the congressional districts. Uh, we're currently in the third congressional district or excuse me, we're in the first congressional district uh, here. And so Judge Renee Werke from Waseca is the designated um, judge from the first uh, congressional district. It happens, I live in New Ulm, I also live in the mm -hmm. first congressional district. So the balance, the, the other 11 of our number can be from anywhere in the state. Okay, do you work primarily in this area? I work, our office is in St. Paul. I'm okay. chambered in St. Paul. And we travel throughout the state. We come to uh, Rochester, um, New Ulm, Detroit Lakes, St. Cloud, Morehead, Bemidji, Duluth, I may be forgetting one <laughs> or two, but we travel throughout the state. So when you come, do you come for a week? Do you come for a day? Usually for one day. Our calendars usually consist of three, or excuse me, of six appeals for the three judges. Um, and litigants are entitled, if they want, to have their appeal heard in the judicial district where the case arose. So when we came down to Rochester today, we heard cases arising in the third judicial district. Uh, from several were from Olmsted, I know. I think there was one from Freeborn. I think there was met one maybe from Wabasha County as well. Area okay. uh, courts in this area. Okay. So, um, so you have been here now this week, and what kind of cases did you hear? Well, the calendar we had today was fairly representative of a calendar that we would get. Uh, of the six cases, two of them were criminal cases where the state had convicted a person who was taking an appeal from that conviction. One of the cases was a civil case involving a claim of damage to property, and it sort of was a civil procedure question. Uh, another was a guardianship case, and then there were two child protection cases. Uh, all of our decisions have to be issued within 90 days, but we have special rules for uh, child protection cases to get those opinions out in 45 days because time is very important to children, as we all know. So you don't have a verdict right that day? Oh, no. No. We um, confer as a panel uh, and arrive at a decision. One of our number is assigned the responsibility of uh, authoring the opinion for the court. If we don't have agreement on all of the cases, then a dissenting opinion may be filed by one of the judges. Uh, most of our cases are unanimous, not all. And I would imagine that it takes some time to get to the appeals court. There must be a process. There is. Uh, a, a, most of our appeals, to be sure, are from the district courts. So usually there has been a trial at the district court level. In criminal cases, there's been a sentence, and then there's an appeal at the end of all of that by the party who is dissatisfied with the outcome in the district court. There's then a briefing process that goes on um, to our court where each party submits written briefs and then the oral arguments that we actually hear are quite short, about 35 minutes per wow. case. But we've probably got several hundred pages of materials and the entire record from the district court uh, that we're working from. So how does someone, do you must hear cases that then go to the Supreme Court? If the a, Minnesota Supreme Court, Yes. Of if a litigant is dissatisfied with the decision of our court, mm -hmm. sometimes that's the same person who was dissatisfied with the district court determination. Sometimes we've altered that district court outcome and a different party is dissatisfied. They have mm -hmm. the right to petition for review by the Minnesota Supreme Court. Appeals to our court are as a matter of right. Anybody can take an appeal and they don't have to ask our permission to take the appeal. Okay. Appeals from our court to the Supreme Court don't work that way, except for first-degree murder appeals that go directly and are of right. 
Appeals from our court are a petition for review where the dissatisfied litigant has to explain to the Supreme Court why it should become involved in this. Examples of um, why the dis Supreme Court might review, maybe it's a new statute that's never been applied before. Maybe it's a question of common law that hasn't been resolved before. Maybe there's doubt about the state of the law and clarification is necessary. So the Supreme Court exercises its discretion as to what it hears. About 95% of the petitions for review are denied. Mm -hmm. About 5% of the petitions for review to the Supreme Court are granted and the Supreme Court makes its decision. And the Supreme Court decides around 100 cases per year wow. in comparison to our approximately 2,000. Mm -hmm. Wow, 2,000. Yes. So I know that citizens can go down to Olmstead County District Court and watch some cases. Can they watch cases at the Appeals Court? Absolutely. Uh, this morning we had the good fortune of uh, being at the Olmstead County Courthouse. We were in courtroom one this morning mm -hmm. and there were in fact members of the public there. Um, our hearings are open to the public and we welcome the public to attend anytime we're in town. Okay, and you have a most memorable case? In, oh, in any of your history? Well, I was on the district court for about 11 plus years before I went to the Court of Appeals. I will say the most memorable case I had on the district court was one that perhaps your viewers have heard of. There was a young child in uh, uh, Brown County who um, had a cancer that his parents began to treat and then discontinued and there was there were quite a number of proceedings concerning that child yeah. um, and eventually he did receive treatment and was doing well. And you were part of that? I was, it was mm -hmm. in front of me. <laughs> All right, thank you so much thank for you. coming in today. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Yeah. So thanks for joining us today on Our Town. Here's hoping you never need a ruling from Judge Rodenberg and his colleagues. Join us next week when Representative Kim Norton and former Representative Bill Queasley provide post-election analysis. See you then on Our Town, the show about Rochester. Cheers.